Today, we'll explore controlled remote viewing as it was taught and practiced by a group of top secret military psychic spies. Doesn't that sound fun? Hey, it's Cheryl Sitz here with another episode of Exploring Possibilities. We're now broadcasting a couple of times a month on journeyofpossibilities.com, Apple Podcast, Google Play, Stitcher, and YouTube slash Cheryl Sitz. And we will chat with Lori Williams in just a second. So this week, I recorded a couple of brief 15 minute interviews for a client of mine and she wanted to put media interactive media like that on her website to let people know more information about what she does i thought that was a brilliant idea we could do that for our listeners what else can we do for our listeners mario well that's the beautiful thing about who we are it's like we actually have the capability to put you on the internet in every way i mean we can put you on instagram we can put you on facebook we can put you on youtube and give you some pointers of how to do it I had somebody the other day say, well, I've never done a YouTube live. I don't know how to do it. We can teach them that. Yes, definitely. That's one of the things uh, because we, the way you and I work, we like to empower everybody. So rather than them relying on us, I mean, we can do that for them for the first few ones, but we really want you to take charge of it and you can see what all is involved. We do it with our energy work. We do it with our coaching and we do it with our online skills. We empower you to reach more people and make a bigger difference. Contact us, CherylSitz.com and MarioRosales.com. Lori Williams mentored for years with Lynn Buchanan, who was part of a now declassified top secret military program of psychic spies. Lori became the first certified civilian controlled remote viewing instructor. She's a member of both the International Remote Viewers Association and the Professional Controlled Remote Viewers Association, where she holds a record for 87% accuracy in their national database. She teaches controlled remote viewing, hypnosis, and intuition development around the world. And now she's got a series of books to teach us controlled remote viewing, the first of which is called Boundless. You can learn all about her online at intuitivespecialists.com. And she took time from her busy schedule to join us today. Hi, Lori. Hi, Cheryl. I'm so excited to have you on the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate being here. (laughs) Well, and a couple of people have already asked because we were going to have you on the last week's show, but something came up and I want you to share what came up because that just blew my mind when you told me what happened. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I I think you're the first person I ever stood up for an interview. (laughs) Uh, um, I just, I was horrified when I realized it. But well, what we had done was I had created uh, four like 45 to 55 minute classes, um, a series of four classes to introduce people to controlled remote viewing and actually give them an opportunity, like a mini class so that they could go through the structure and then actually do their own remote viewing session. And so it was spread out over four days and it started on Tuesday last week on Tuesday. And so it went from Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and the last one was on Friday. And so I was putting this out in the week before and I didn't, you know, really think about how many people might sign up. I just was trying to create a quality thing for people, something of real value that would really give them a good taste of what remote viewing was all about. And to my shock and surprise, 4,300 people signed up (laughs) to attend it. So that was so massive um, and so unexpected that it just, you know, I just was shocked. And, and of course, then we, I was scrambling. We were all scrambling. We were scrambling to answer questions and scrambling to make sure that the technology could handle the onslaught. <laughs> and, and interestingly, Cheryl, um, you know, when it comes to this sort of thing, they say if you get a 20% participation rate, you're doing good. If you get 30%, you're doing excellent. We had 80% participation rate. Wow. So it was phenomenal. And, uh, and of course, you know, I was, I, I was meeting myself coming and going as they say, <laughs> and don't they say that in Texas? I think yeah, yeah, <laughs> we do myself coming and going. So we, um, yeah, it was pretty phenomenal. And, uh, and then of course I missed your, my interview with you because I was all swamped and I was actually, I think live online at the time I was supposed to be, uh, doing the interview Aww. with you. I was doing a live broadcast at that moment. So here I am to make up for it. Well, thank you. And you came right back with, oh, no, I didn't mean to miss this. Let's fix this. I feel bad. So thank you for getting me right back on your calendar when I know you are obviously swamped right now. I'm not surprised, Lori. This is 
So just to fill in the listeners, this is a way that we can use our intuition and know that we're getting accurate information. Because one of the main questions that seems to come up is, well, is it really my intuition or am I just making this up? And you have come through with a protocol that you're teaching. Well, you didn't. Tell us the fun story of the Psychic Spy Program, because I don't think we can believe the movie that George Clooney did. That wasn't really the way it went. (laughs) (laughs) George Clooney read a book called Men Who Stare at Goats that was written by a man named John Ronson. And John, and it's not a funny book. I mean, it's a serious book. And John wrote it as, you know, as a journalist interviewing all a lot of the key players, including Lynn Buchanan. And of course, George Clooney's character was named Lynn and spelled the same way, L-Y-N. You don't meet a lot of men named Lynn, you know. So uh, George Clooney's character was Lynn. And so he actually interviewed key characters um, for this book. And then I guess George read the book and thought this would make a hilarious movie, you know. (laughs) (laughs) And so... He, he made the movie, and uh, interestingly, they filmed it um, just outside of Alamogordo at the White Sands Missile Range. I thought a lot of the movie was filmed there, and that happens to be where Lynn Buchanan lives, is in Alamogordo. So so that, that was also an interesting coincidence. Um, and when I saw the movie, I think I laughed louder than anyone in the theater <laughs> because – I know a lot of those characters myself, you know, they, I, they, I pr- I'm personally acquainted with quite a few of them. And so it really made me laugh. Um, and funnily, you know, I meet a lot of Americans who have never heard of the movie or never seen it. And I ran into a Swiss couple the other day um, and they were going through the United States interviewing Americans um, just about, you know, like just random things like, what do you think of American politics? What do you think of global warming? You know, just kind of random questions. And they became fascinated because we live, you know, off grid in earth ships and they wanted to come up and they interview us. And so they did, they came up to interview us. And then of course we, we talked about remote viewing and I said, well, have you heard of the movie men who stare at goats? I figured it was a long shot, but I would ask. And they were like, that's our favorite movie. We've seen it five times. And I said, oh, well, you know, I, uh, that's what I do. And that the, the, the people in the movie are friends of mine. And they said, you mean that's a true story? <laughs> they, were, they were amazed. They couldn't believe that that was a true story. But, but essentially what happened was during the cold war, the United States military was losing some of its military secrets. The Russians were finding out a lot of stuff and they could not figure out where the leak was. How were they getting our information? This man defected from Russia and he had documents showing that Russia had a psychic spying program. And when people hear this, they're just incredulous. A what? A (laughs) psychic spying program? So the U.S., when this guy defected and they realized this, that they actually had that, that Russia actually had that, they decided, OK, well, we've got to have something to combat this or to compete or something. So they went to Stanford Research Institute in Palo Alto, California, which is a top secret think tank that's part of Stanford University. And they they hired these two physicists, Hal Putoff and Russell Targ, and Hal and Russ were physicists who had helped to pioneer the laser, believe it or not. So these are brilliant men. And they said, look, we do something, figure this out. So they they started doing a lot of research into extrasensory perception, telepathy, clairvoyance, all those things. And they did a ton of experiments using Faraday cages, big cages that would block EMF signals, you know, trying to keep these guys pure from pollution or any outside influences. And they just had phenomenal results. Uh, One of the interesting, very early experiments they did, they got two guys, Ingo Swan and Pat Price, both had uh, proven psychic ability. And they decided they would have one of their guys just assign a random target blind to these guys. So they had no idea what they were looking at. And the guy chose a hunting cabin in the woods, his, his hunting cabin in the woods. And so unbeknownst to the guy who assigned the target, really close by was an underground top secret military facility. And they were in the midst of a top secret project that no one except the very, very top brass knew about. So these two psychics go to this facility because it was right next to the, you know, it was right under the, the hunting cabinet. They they go into this facility and they actually reported the names, the the code names that were on the files in the cabinets. Wow. And so that caused <laughs> huge, huge 
you know, uproar because then, then everybody was like, oh my gosh, we've got a, you know, we've got a mole, we've got a spy, we've got to figure out what's happening. And they did a huge investigation and found out that indeed it had come through a psychic source. I mean, it was not, there was no, no hanky panky involved. It was true psychic ability. So then they were like, okay, this is serious. We, if the mind, if consciousness is not limited, then how are we safe? I mean, are, that means there are no secrets. And of course, governments survive from their secrets, right? That's how they, that's right. how they at least nowadays. So that was pretty scary, I think, for them. But they then they ended up hiring Ingo, who was one of the psychics on that very first experiment. They hired him to come up with a written set of protocols because this is a military, right? They're like, hey, we want to be able to teach you know, the, a common guy, common soldier on the front lines, we want to be able to pull him in and teach him a step-by-step method that will allow anyone to access their psychic ability, separate imagination from true psychic perceptions. Yes, exactly. To me, that's what's profound about this. Is it something that's a protocol that anybody can follow and get results? You're actually training the psychic gift, so to speak, right? Well, yes, I mean, everybody's psychic. So I don't actually train people to be psychic. I just help people discover their own ability and learn how to separate it from all the other yes. noise that goes on in your brain. Perfect. <laughs> yes. And so, yeah, so when we teach this, we teach that, you know, the body is the link. I mean, how many times do you drive and you pull in your driveway and not remember the last few blocks because you were thinking about what you were going to make for dinner that night or whatever. So the body is able to respond to the subconscious and the subconscious can control the body. Your heart's beating, your lungs are breathing, a million billion processes taking place right now that you're not aware of. By the same token, your conscious mind also works and responds with the body. You could raise your right hand if I asked you to right now. So the body is the link. So CRV or controlled remote viewing is a physical discipline and it's all done through the body, kind of like a martial art. And it's a step-by-step process that anyone can learn. Um, They really needed it to be that way for military purposes and nowadays, of course, we don't use it for psychic spying. We <laughs> use it. We use it for all kinds of things. We helped an archaeologist who had been who had spent forty years of his life looking for some artifacts in a two hundred square mile area of ocean. We were able to, with a team of viewers, we were able to give him GPS coordinates, lead him to those artifacts, and tell him what he would find when he got there. And uh, we've done a huge report on this and uh, we're are working with the archaeologists now to create a, kind of a, a, a book or something where we can share this amazing, amazing project. But that's just one example. We can use it for archaeology. There's another book uh, that was written years ago by uh, Stefan Schwartz, and it's called The Alexandria Project, where he took a whole team of remote viewers out on a ship and they identified over 200 sunken vessels in the ocean. Um, so there's nowadays, of course, we can use it to help in elusive medical diagnosis. Um, I was involved in a project, I think there were 36 viewers, and we were all assigned to remote view a microphage that eats antibiotic resistant bacteria. And so the, the point of the research was really to see can remote viewers remote view uh, microscopic things? Because if so, that could lead to some interesting discoveries and maybe even help in, you know, in some some of the crises we may be facing down the road if we did come up with completely antibiotic resistant bacteria. So, I mean, there are some, of course, already, but I mean, if it became a threat to our survival. And so um, in this research we did, I I had what is known as an aesthetic impact, Cheryl, and that is when the remote viewer goes from describing the target to interacting or relating to the target many times in a spatial relationship, like it's above me, it's next to me, it's in front of me, um, or, you know, has some sort of perception that includes both me as the viewer and the target, you know, so if you were the remote viewer, the aesthetic impact occurs when you have a perception that includes both you and the target. Right, and so right. and so, I had this aesthetic impact on that research project with the microphage, in which I suddenly felt like I was riding a roller coaster in the dark, and the roller coaster was all lit up and twisting off into you know just twisting off into space in front of me, and I went, oh my gosh, Jim, I think I just rode a strand of DNA, <laughs> and 
And then I went, oh, this target, whatever it is, because I was totally blind to the target. I wasn't told what I was viewing. I said, this target is is microscopic. And then I ended up doing a, a report that contained, I believe it was 148 perceptions. And so the researchers took my perceptions to, um, and, and several other viewers who were excellent, they took all of the the ver- what they considered the very best to the scientists who are specialists in microphages, but know nothing about remote viewing and just said, would you score these for accuracy? And mine came up 98% accurate in it, in the perceptions there. So it's just a phenomenal, a phenomenal thing. Um, other types of targets we've done, for example, I've, uh, the, the source of airplane crashes, for example, an airplane crashes and they don't know what caused the crash. Um, that's a great target for a remote viewer because the remote viewer can kind of pinpoint and sketch the source of the crash. You and know, are what, they doing that by going back to before the crash happens and doing it, or are they doing it based on what's going on right now, whatever remains are left or whatever? No, no, we actually moved to, that's a great thing about CRV is it's a time machine uh, in essence. Yeah. So no, so I was given this, I was told the target's an event, describe the target. So I start describing it and I, I'm describing the inside of a cockpit that, um, and I noticed that the screen had sections to it, the, the, you know, the screen inside the cockpit. And, um, and I didn't think much about it, but I'm describing the screen and sections. And it turned out it was a 1950s airplane, which indeed they did make the windshields in sections. And, um, so anyway, I, as I was describing this and I was noticing that, you know, the weather was great, the pilot and the co-pilot were just chatting away and everything was normal. And then I suddenly things were tilting and falling and people were shouting and there was some smoke and, and I said, something is failing. And my monitor said, move to the failing and describe. And I then proceeded to sketch what I had no idea what I was sketching, but I was sketching something very mechanical. And, uh, my monitor happened to know that that was the inside of a 1950s aircraft engine because his father was a an aircraft mechanic in the 50s and so he knew exactly what part I was sketching I know nothing about machines or engines or anything but I was sketching what I was perceiving and uh and now we actually have a photo of the engine of that uh model plane and we can put it side by side with my sketch and so it's pretty it's it's really it's fascinating to me that I could sketch something that I have no knowledge of I mean that I'm absolutely not aware of you know almost like you're making yourself uh, you're ju- it just shows how consciousness is so unlimited. That's why my book is called Boundless, because consciousness is unlimited, and we are not limited by consciousness at all. Well, and I want to point out real quick, too, that you're not a fancy artist or anything either, right? Like, you don't have no. to have fabulous artistic skills or any of those things to be able to do this work. No, in fact, I have to confess that I squawked when I was, I'm Italian and I was, and I was waving my hands and I was saying, well, the failing thing is like this. And I was doing all this stuff with my hands and I said, um, could you sketch that for me? And I was like, no, I can't sketch it. Cause I'm, you know, I don't, I don't, this is some kind of mechanical thing. And I don't know anything about machines and I'm not that great of an artist, blah, 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 you know, he said, could, could you just try, try sketching it for me? You know? And then I ended up actually doing a pretty good sketch, <laughs> but right. um, sometimes we can do what we don't think to do, but I have a number of techniques that I teach my students, especially if they're like, Lori, I can't draw a straight line. I mean, you know, I don't think I'm going to be able to do this. And I'm like, oh, no, you know, I'll show you some really cool t- techniques you can use to be able to sketch something at the target and really give some useful information. You've done such a great job. I'm sure you've d- talked about this a lot because you do a really great job of synthesizing this information so that we can get a grasp of what you're talking about. And and you say that corporations hire you. Other than looking for objects, what other practical uses might this have for the everyday person? Oh, my goodness. Well, you know, there I, I can just rattle off a few. One is that uh, heads of corporations can use it, for example, for strategic planning. Now, we're always careful to – we try not to work with people who – uh, you know, we, we kind of try to vet people who approach us because we don't want to be doing corporate espionage, for example. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, uh, but, uh, and, and the thing is, thankfully we're remote viewers, so we can always check out people's motives, but, <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so there's, there's, uh, strategic planning, which anybody can do really. I mean, when you think about it, strategic planning isn't just for corporations. I mean, parents have to plan things for their kids and, 
Uh, we used it frequently to with our kids when our kids were growing up. Um, so I have seven children I gave birth to and two that are stepkids that I absolutely love. And we uh, we now have we're waiting for our 21st grandchild. And um, I always joke that we Yay. finally figured out what was causing that. But uh, <laughs> anyway, so we, <laughs> but we um, anyway, so when we were raising our kids and we had a bunch of teenagers, you know, and they of course, teenagers are faced with all kinds of temptations, you know, sexual temptations, drug temptations, you know, you name it, they're they're faced with it. So we were able to use remote viewing to keep our kids safe a lot when they were growing up. And my kids today joke about it. Like it was really hard growing up with parents who were remote viewers because we couldn't <laughs> get away with anything. You know? <laughs> but uh, anyway, so yeah, so it's great for parenting. Um, it's really great for like people who are involved in sales. Like just to give an example, if you were a realtor, you could use remote viewing to remote view the house this couple is going to buy. And you describe the house. You go by descriptions. One of our mantras is describe, don't identify. So you describe the house that these people are going to buy. And then you, when you go to show them houses, you show them houses that fit the descriptions that you came up with in your session. And, um, and that instead of having to show them 20 houses before they find the one they love, they buy the first one or the second one. And so you can save a ton of time for yourself and for them, you know, in, in taking them right to the house of their dreams, because sometimes we don't know what we want. Right. You know, we just don't know. Whereas if you're moving to the house they're going to buy, then that makes it so much easier when you're, by moving to, I mean, mentally in your session, you're moving to the house they're going to buy and you're describing it to yourself so that you now have an edge. We, you know, I, one of my, one of my uh, mottos is live smarter. (laughs) You know, why not? Why not live smarter and give yourself an edge? You know, so I think controlled remote viewing is a wonderful edge for practical day to day stuff like parenting and career choices and even romance and things like that. You know, just there's so many things you can do with it. Um, So it's, it's a very handy tool. Well, I just want to tag on to this question about what can you use it for? I actually have listeners who are quite into alien and galactic things. Is it limited to Earth? No, not at all. (laughs) In fact, fact, if you go to my website at intuitivespecialists.com, there is a blog and also on the media page, which your interview will probably pop up on the media page. But at at the top of the media page is an article that I wrote for a remote viewing magazine called Eight Martinis, a really good magazine that you can read for free online, by the way, eightmartinis.com. But Eight Martinis magazine, um, I did an article called 18 Years of Excitement. And it was, it has, I, this was done like five years ago because now it's 23 years of excitement. But, <laughs> um, but anyway, 18 Years of Excitement is has a a bunch of some of my most exciting sessions that I did. It also includes the sketch, I think, of the engine and a photo of the engine from that plane I just mentioned. And and one uh, that I did on Mars, a session on Mars that was fascinating. And so, um, you know, if your readers are into into intergalactic things, um, a lot of your readers might be fans of CE5 or Dr. Stephen Greer. I'm not sure. Yes. But um, yeah, Stephen, uh, I, I'm, I'm actually appearing in his new documentary that's coming out in December, um, Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind. And, uh, you know, I didn't really know Stephen. Um, and I suddenly got a call asking if I would appear on this documentary. And I, uh, I said, well, are you sure that you want me? I mean, <laughs> this, you know, I don't have, I don't have a lot of data to share as far as science, scientific data. And they said, no, we want you to talk about consciousness. And well, that's right up my alley. And then when when Stephen shared his vision for the documentary, which is to raise the consciousness of the planet, I said, oh, my gosh, you're talking my language now, because that's my vision as well. I mean, we need to create critical mass, Cheryl, where we can change, you know, flip the consciousness of the planet to a higher level. Absolutely. But so I think a lot of those 4,300 people, uh, well, we know for sure at least 1,500 of them came about because of Stephen Greer's endorsement of me and, and put and his wife put out a thing to the entire uh, their entire community saying, hey, you can take this free remote viewing course, this free mini introduction introductory course. It's called Introduction to Practical Remote Viewing. Introduction to Practical Remote Viewing. <laughs> That's a mouthful. And can we have we missed that? Is it done or can we go take it now? 
No, it's going to be available till August 8th. Yay! Yeah, so it is going to be available. And just actually just going to my website, I think you can go to my website and still access it at intuitivespecialist.com. I think a little pop-up comes up and offers you to watch it. So it's all recorded. You can watch the whole thing. See, not only did I do these these videos each day, but afterwards I did a live Q&A for over an hour every day. Well, just barely a little like an hour and six minutes or something every day. Um, and so, you know, all I answered all these questions uh, that people had from watching the videos. And then on the fourth day, I actually walk everyone through a remote viewing session and show them their target. And then and then at the end of that, so this, this is like four days packed with value. And I have to tell you something kind of funny. I think out of thousands and thousands, we literally, I mean, over, I, I was literally answering over a thousand comments per day. Wow. And, um, and out of thousands and thousands of comments, I only had three people who in the middle of the thing, like on the second day, were saying, oh, this is just going to be a big sales pitch. And, uh, and so I said, okay, well, you know, if you don't find value in it, you know, then it's CRV is not for you. But this wasn't a sales pitch. This was a solid class. People were amazed. They were like, we thought it was going to be a sales pitch. And I actually got apologies from those people when they watched all four of them. They were like, I'm so sorry. I really thought it was just going to be a big sales pitch. But I do offer at the end of the class, I'm not a salesperson. I'm an instructor. I'm a teacher. And that's my passion. And I, you know, I could actually be living in this beautiful place we have with gorgeous views and not work. And, uh, you know, we, I didn't need to do this, but I do it because I'm so passionate about it. So I had, um, people were so excited and I do offer them the opportunity to sign up for a six week course, uh, practical remote viewing for busy people. And so I, I give them that opportunity to sign up for, um, for the course. It's a six week basic course because so many people are unable to take my live three day workshops. So, uh, you know, now offering six week courses where they can just get short little video you know, a module every week with a bunch of short little videos that they can watch while they're doing the dishes or cleaning the bathroom or whatever, you know, doing laundry. <laughs> then, you know, then that makes it so much more easy for people. It's so yes. much easier. And I was so impressed when you told me. So I've, I'm, I'm in Boundless. I'm toward the end of, of your first book. And that's the first of, I believe, six. So this is an extensive protocol to, to learn and understand. There's a lot of pieces to it. I was so impressed when you said that in this little mini course that you did for free, people were already having a control remote viewing experience. So I'm definitely going to go do that. And I may do your, your longer course because I think everybody could benefit from honing our natural abilities into something that's reliable, that we can be crystal clear that yes, I'm actually viewing. I'm not dreaming this up and I don't need to worry about whether it's all in my imagination. I love the way you language the difference there. Really. And you know, one thing I want to point out, you asked about, uh, you know, can you view things that are off planet? And so what we do is, um, and, and I say this, especially for your viewers who are really interested in intergalactic things, because, boy, I mean, what's not interesting about that right now? Right. So much going on. Uh, and we live out here in New Mexico, so we see UFOs all the time. <laughs> but, um, but one of the one of the things I want to point out that we like to do is we like to make this very concrete and dependable. And we don't want anybody to fool themselves, you know, because it would really be easy for me to go, Cheryl, you know, last night. I traveled to the planet of Zircon in the galaxy of Nemzes, and I had the most amazing experience. And and sure, maybe it was a, an amazing euphoric experience, but there is absolutely no proof of whether I was just making something up and having an amazing imaginary experience or whether there's any validity, right? Right. So the only way to know is to create a dependable track record on targets for which there is proof, for which there is validity. So for example, if I have a photograph of a shiny red car and it's in an envelope and I say, can you describe what's in this envelope? And you say, well, it's red, smooth, and shiny. Well, then you have given me three correct descriptors, right? Right. I can show you the photo and you can score your session. Of course, I, most people get a lot more than three, but, uh, you know, I mean, just using as this, a short example, you could score your session based on the photograph I hand you and you're scoring what you wrote down based, you know, uh, compared to what I'm handing you and saying, this is the target you were just working on. Okay. So that gives you concrete proof, but your ego has to deal with it. If you said it was blue, smooth and shiny, then you have to say, oh, I got it wrong. It's not blue. It's red. And so a lot of um, what we notice is there's a lot of people out there who claim to teach remote viewing who are actually teaching kind of a form of guided meditation. 
And they only use what we call esoteric targets, targets for which there will there is not or probably never will be feedback. Because then people can go, oh my God, I had the most amazing experience. You know, I am the best remote viewer that ever lived because I had this amazing experience. And they just kind of feed off that and their egos when in reality, it's just a big imaginary experience unless you have something, some kind of track record. So if I have somebody who has a 90% accuracy rate in colors and we give that person um, an interstellar target that for which there is no feedback, but they say, well, that planet is purple. I can be 90% sure the planet really is purple because that person has a really high track record and they were blind to the target. They didn't know what they were remote viewing, but yet they had, you know, they, they determined that what they were remote viewing was purple. I'm just using that as an example, but. And that's why you had 4,000 people show up because of that, because that is powerful stuff. If we're looking for some confirmation for many of us, I think, especially since this big shift in, in energy since 2012, so many of us are still awakening or newly awakened. And we want to know, Hey, is this real? How can I, how can I know that this stuff's real? What I'm getting, this is an actual protocol that we can follow and know that what we're getting is real. And that's real valuable for us right now. It is. We even have data sheets. And I mean, you know, people, when they're thinking about psychic stuff, they're not thinking about data. They're not thinking about data sheets. My children um, joke, they call me Madame Minerva. <laughs> and I always, and so Madame Minerva is my alter ego. And I joke, you know, this is, if, if you want to know, is Madame Minerva in the gypsy tent any good at her, at her psychic readings? Maybe, she, you know, somebody might say, well, yeah, she told me this and that, and she was accurate. But what's, it, there's a whole difference between Madame Minerva in the gypsy tent and a, and a trained controlled remote viewer. Yes. When, for example, when I met the archaeologist that I mentioned earlier, and I said, have you ever worked with remote viewers? He said, oh, yeah, yeah, I have. And I knew that he had not. I knew that he had worked with psychics. And so many people don't know the difference. So they class them all in the same bowl. And I do have a number of people who, who are my students who are amazing remote viewers, who when they started working with me, were already well known, um, had several television shows, and were well known psychics. And they became remote viewers. But the difference is psychics, it's not controlled, whereas controlled remote viewing, it's all about control and you can database your results, you know. And so that's it's, it's a, there's a science to controlled remote viewing that is lacking in just ordinary natural psychic ability. Absolutely. Well, I love how you lay it out in the book. I forget who, if this was a, a story borrowed from, from Lynn or someone, but you tell the story about how important it is to get the thinking mind out of the way so that the unconscious mind can deliver the information that we're seeking. And you, you tell the story of a CEO and I'll let you tell it because you'll do it better. Oh yeah. This actually did come from Lynn. Thank you for mentioning that. It's called the president of the company analogy. And in the president of the company analogy, it's that if you think of your conscious mind, like the CEO of your company, and of course, this, I mean, or, or the president of the company, and if the CEO of the board of directors comes to the president and says, we want you to take a vacation for a few weeks, we're going to let somebody else run the company. Well, initially, you know, the conscious mind, the president is going, wait a minute, wait a minute, that, this is my baby. You know, who are you going to, you know, who's going to come in and run my company? And you say, no, no, it's okay. We're going to have your own child, who uh, your adult child run the company. Well, then you're kind of conflicted because you want your adult child to do okay and you love your child. But at the same time, you don't want this child to make you look bad and you don't want anybody messing your, with your company, not even your own child, right? So the analogy is basically explaining that, you know, when we have our conscious mind doesn't want to let the subconscious suddenly come in and take over and have a voice because it's it feels like it needs to be in control. The conscious mind wants to be in control. So we refer to the conscious mind as the president. And then the subconscious is kind of like the kid who's trying to run the company in, in the president's absence. But if you send the president away to go to the beach for, you know, a few weeks, there's going to be constant interference. How you doing, kid? You know, how's it going? Uh, why don't you wait till I get back before you try that? You know, those kinds of things. So the idea of this complex structure of controlled remote viewing is set up so that we can get the president down at the bo a docks, stacking boxes. Let's get the president busy. Keep him busy. So the structure of controlled remote viewing is designed to keep the conscious mind occupied. And we actually refer to controlled remote viewing as an interview and report methodology. And so it's like the conscious mind is interviewing the subconscious yes. and doing and doing all the W's and the H, right? Who, what, when, where, why, and how. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, and, and somewhere else in the book, I forget what the line was, but it was something to the effect of we don't focus on the thing that we want to view. We focus on the process and let that thing reveal itself. I forget. Yes. The... Ingo, Ingo Swan had a huge banner above his desk that said, sight be damned, structure is everything. That's it. I remembered. I, I was like, I can't remember that quote, but it was so good. Yes, that's it. <laughs> So sight be damned means the target sight, because with controlled remote viewing, we we assume that our subconscious mind is plugged in to everything that ever has been or ever will be in all of time and space, as if we're plugged into a giant cosmic database in the sky, let's say. I <laughs> like that. Help people understand it. So if you're plugged into this cosmic database and there's a part of you that knows everything, all we have to do is create a mechanism to get to that information. And we, it's all done through the body. And so we create a language we, that opens the door between conscious and subconscious. Um, and we then are able to communicate with the subconscious mind. And we give the president or the conscious mind something to keep it feeling important and to keep it busy so that the subconscious can come through and give the information. That lays it out so beautifully. It's really a good visual for what's going on when we're doing this controlled remote viewing. So is this the focus for your life kind of moving forward in terms of what you want to teach? Is this kind of what you want to keep expanding for people? Yes, I have a real passion for controlled remote viewing and the other types of remote viewing. There's associative remote viewing. There's extended remote viewing. Controlled remote viewing is kind of the basket in, and the others are like tools that you can use in the basket. They all have their own purposes, but uh, but I love CRV because you can use ERV within CRV. You can use ARV within CRV. And so it's all, uh, you know, it's all wonderful. You can, CRV allows a psychic or a, an average person who's never had a psychic experience in their entire lives to access that intuitive part of yourself and to be able to not only access it, but control it and use it on demand. Because if you think about it, Cheryl, what if, you know, we all have sometimes those little gut instincts. And when we follow them, it works out great. When we don't, we're, we regret it. And, but what if you could access that kind of knowing on demand, you know, whenever you needed to? How would that affect your relationships? How would that affect your finances? How would that affect your career? You know, and, and maybe even save your life. I mean, I, I have stories where I have been warned through my intuition and it's literally saved my life. So, um, so, you know, how does, how can everyone, how could it affect everyone's life? And if we, if we got this information out more and people were able to use their intuition more, maybe we'd have fewer car accidents. Maybe we'd have more honesty because people would know, well, you know, <laughs> there's no secrets. Might as well not lie about this. <laughs> exactly. You just, you tapped into me there because that's where I was going next is like, aren't people going to get paranoid that, oh my good, goodness, we, I already feel like my data isn't secure anymore and people know too much about me. And aren't people going to get paranoid about all of us psychic viewers, can, CRVs running around tapping into their stuff? Well, this is something, you know, I, every now and then I have people say, Lori, how can I protect myself against people remote viewing me? And my answer to that is, why are people remote viewing you? <laughs> I mean, I mean, really, uh, because in a way, um, sometimes the fear that somebody's looking into my mind and knows all my secrets is like people have lives, you know, and, <laughs> you know, remote viewers have a lot better things to do than, you know, to peek in and be, be psychic voyeurs into your mind and see what you're doing. And I find that people who really get caught up in that kind of paranoia are often suffering from severe narcissism, to be honest with you. Yeah. And you know, this is probably going to make some people angry because <laughs> maybe some people feel like they're being remote viewed. But, um, but I mean, that's the thing is, you know, Lynn and I have discussed this at length. And now Lynn is, is a spy, right? He's an ex-spy. He's no longer a current spy, but he, he was a spy. He knows all about spying. And he's like, you know, people worry that, you know, I get letters, he, Lynn says he gets letters all the time, you know, are you remote viewing me? <laughs> you know, why would I, why would I take time away from my family to remote view you, you know? And, and also one thing is that because controlled remote viewing was developed as a spying tool, it was developed in such a way that the structure itself keeps it undetectable. So if somebody were using this style of remote viewing to remote view you, 
you wouldn't know it because it is completely undetectable. And so, and so um, it's not, and people say, well, why do we need it to be undetectable? Well, maybe we don't now, but back then when they developed it, that was, you know, it had to be undetectable because if, for example, um, some, I get a lot of people who say, well, do we use out of body experience or astral projection for this? And I say heartily, no, we don't because astral projection is detectable. There are actual documented cases where people have been seen while astral projecting. I mean, it's like a, it's almost like you're like a ghost. I mean, there's, it's visible and uh, animals can see you and you're astral projecting and bark and things like that. So if, if you were astral projecting, for example, to a top secret military installation, the guard dogs would probably start barking and they would see the dogs barking on the closed circuit television and say, okay, we need to switch to a different plan because we've been, our security has been compromised. Right. And so um, they had to create something that was undetectable. So when people say, oh, a remote viewer is remote viewing me, I say, well, they're either really lousy at remote viewing <laughs> or you're imagining things because, right. uh, because it's, it doesn't work that way. And again, you know, come on, folks, you know, why are you so important? Do you have some top secret job? Now, if maybe if you were like, you know, some top government official, yes, then maybe some other government would have some one of their remote viewers remote viewing you. But if you're not, if you're just an ordinary Joe, like you and me, Cheryl, I consider myself pretty ordinary. Um, I don't think people have a reason to remote view us. Uh, you know, and I mean, and, and even me, you know, I've been teaching this for uh, 19 years, I've been a remote viewer for 23 years. And, uh, you know, I my husband and I joke because He's like, you fly under the radar because everyone underestimates you because you're just this tiny little Italian lady. And, you know, I'm 62. And I just, you know, no, no one would ever look at me and consider me threatening, you know, <laughs> you know. And so my mother, who's 89, she said, oh, I worry. I worry about you. I said, why do you worry, mom? She said, I worry because you're so powerful. And I laughed. I was like, why would you think that I am powerful? I'm not that powerful, you know, but it's just hilarious because uh, people get this idea. I think it's all, you know, all the cloak and dagger history of yeah. remote viewing that people start really, really getting excited. And I had a guy come up to me at a conference once and he said, I've been having, uh, I've been having these daydreams that I'm getting, uh, or I'm getting picked up by men in black and they're threatening to deport me if I won't remote view for them. And I laughed and I said, you're having delusions of grandeur. <laughs> And he was a good friend. I mean, he wasn't just a stranger. He was a good friend. I said, you're having delusions of grandeur. Because if that was going to happen to anyone, it would happen to me. And I was laughing. You know, <laughs> and we were, all, we were all laughing. It was just a joke. But, the, you know, it's just, um, it's just funny how we can get caught up in the drama. I think probably a high percentage of us as humans, just human nature, is to be very dramatic. You know, yes. oh, I'm going to be kidnapped by men in black and I'm going to be <laughs> taken off to remote view in in some deep dungeon somewhere in the Washington, D.C. You know, I mean, that's crazy. <laughs> so, uh, no, I don't think so. I think that we're all, you know, I think we all get a little over dramatized. But at the same time, people do get upset sometimes if I if I talk like this, because they're like, well, don't make light of the fact that, yes, as you mentioned, Cheryl, our security and our privacy is being compromised by technology and and um, and IT, you know, and e and uh, what is what is it called? Um, oh, gosh, where they're talking AI. No, yeah, is it is no oh, artificial intelligence? Oh, AI. yeah. AI. AI. You know, a, a, yeah, the, you know, that's no joke. That is happening. And I don't mean to make light of any of any of that. Um, and I do know that there are sinister forces and there are scary things happening. I just want to offer some technique, because if there are bad guys out there using remote viewing for sinister purposes, which you I can pretty much guarantee you there are, then don't you think we should balance things out by having good people learn it? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Know. That's perfect. I love where you went with that. Because that's really where I go with my life. Like I don't sit around and worry about all the bad stuff. I'm too busy enjoying the good stuff. Because either way, what good does worrying do anyway? And the more of us learn these things for, for good, the better. So I love that. Good response. <laughs> That's how I feel is that we need to balance out the, the if there's a lot of evil and bad out there, let's balance it out. And, you know, also, I think there's a lot of proof, a uh, heavy evidence that weighs on the side of we create our own reality. Yes. You know, whether you want to call it the law of attraction or anything like that, we do create our reality. And therefore, I tell people, don't 
sit around in fear and focus on your fears and imagine your fears coming to pass. Sit around and think about what you want your life to be. Think about what you want the world to be like and focus on that. Exactly. Think about that instead. I think that's huge. It is huge. Thank you for that. That's perfect. So I know you have a lot of exciting stuff coming up. Your book, is it out officially now, Boundless, or is it coming out soon? Boundless is available on Kindle. Okay. Right now, it's just available on Kindle. We are working very hard on the print book. And uh, and now the ball's in my court. We The ball keeps going back and forth between the lady who's been doing all the formatting for me and the other lady who's doing the cover. And then they send it to me to proof. And of course, I haven't been able to do anything this week, but... But but, just but answer being, comments you know, and questions <laughs> and doing these videos. So um, so I have to now go through the last proof of everything. And then if it's good, we're good to go. We can send it off to get the first printed proofs done. Then those have to be checked. And then once those are done, then we uh, then we're ready to go to the press, go to press and get it in print. It is um, a great book. And I do kind of, I think I would prefer a paper copy because there are some great diagrams and things in there that you may actually want to bookmark and dog ear and, and refer back to. So if you're planning to get the books and learn it that way, I would kind of recommend the print version or have something that really clearly easily bookmarks for the digital copy so that you can flip back and forth and, and reference some of the, the maps and things that you're going to want to use, some of the charts and things. So That is exactly right because it's really a manual. You yes. Know, and so you know, it's hard to have it on Kindle. However, it, you know, I just wanted to get it out quickly so people could at least start kind of dipping their toes in. It takes a long time. Well, not necessarily a long time, but it takes a bit. Have, did you ever learn to drive a stick shift, Cheryl? That's what I still drive. Yes. And I think part of it was I'm afraid if I stop driving it, I'll forget how because it did take a long time to learn to do that. Oh gosh, the first <laughs> time I learned to do it, I thought I was just going to die. And and then, of course, you know, it became second nature and I didn't even think about it. And that's the way CRV is. But the first time you, you know, like I tell people when they come to take my three day workshops, I tell them the first day of the basic course is the hardest day you will ever spend with me learning remote viewing. And, you know, so once you get past that first day, be happy because it's, you know, it's downhill from there. But, but, but initially it's the hardest because we don't have the neural pathways formed in our brains yet. And we're learning all this new stuff. It's a new paradigm that we have to, you know, conquer. And so people often leave the first day of class just overwhelmed going, wow, that was so much information holy cow, you know, and they're just overwhelmed. And I tell them, just go to sleep. Don't try Don't think about remote viewing, go to bed. And in the morning, get a really good night's sleep. And in the morning, you'll feel refreshed. And then when you, we, you come back, we do a review. And the review seems so much easier, because now you've had some neural pathways forming during the night. Well, I, my book, the goal of the book is to help those neural pathways start because people can read the book, and they can set it down and walk away and go have dinner and come back and read it some more. And they, you know, and they can read the same part over and over if they want till they feel like they've got it. And it just starts sinking in, you know, and it yes. starts becoming subconscious. It does. And it's wonderful. And I love it. So that's the book. It's called Boundless. You've got all kinds of information. You've got the course. That, so we need to go to the website now, intuitivespecialists.com. And you can dip your toes in and see how it feels for you. And maybe join me in that extended class that I since I'm going to be taking. I've kind of felt that coming ever since I started reading your book. It's like, wow, I, I meet so many great people and learn so many great practices. But most of them for whatever reason, don't feel like something for me to go deeper in. But this just seems so powerful and so valuable. So I look forward to to playing with you more in this space. Thank you for teaching this. Thank you, Cheryl. You know, I think that we all could use it like a Swiss Army knife that we just carry in our pocket. Yeah. Because Swiss Army knives are so handy. I remember one year my, my husband said, what do you want for your birthday? I said, I want a really good Swiss Army knife. <laughs> and so my mom calls and she's like, what did Jim get you for your birthday? I said, a Swiss Army knife. She's like, oh. That's romantic, <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm very romantic, but um, but they're so handy, and that's what controlled remote viewing is. Regardless of what your job is, regardless of what you do with your life, um, you can use this as a tool, and it, it's got a it's got something for everybody, really. Lori, thank you so much for being on the show. I love your personality and what you what you show up with and how you're helping us expand and, and realize our potential in this great way to, to truly create higher consciousness on earth. I like to ask my guests at the end if they have a parting thought they'd like to leave us with today. Yes, my biggest parting thought is love. I have discovered through remote viewing 
that love is not just an emotion. Love is a force like gravity. And you don't have to feel tiny and small because just as there is no time and time is happening all at once, there really is no size either. We're all connected and consciousness is like a a gigantic web that is happening all at once and it's bound together with love, which is the one constant through all dimensions, all universes, all realities. That's what I want to share. That is fabulous. Thank you for that. And thank you so much for joining us for the show today. Let us know what you think. Mario and I put a lot into this show each week. So if you find value, do me a favor and and rate the show wherever you listen to it so others can find it. And if you've got a little cash to throw our way, we'd love it to support our continuing this show. You can do that at journeyofpossibilities.com slash support. Either way, join us next time for another great conscious conversation on exploring possibilities.